Hello, I'm Sumit Burz. Welcome to the Net Hero podcast. This podcast is for you if you're interested in business and reducing our carbon footprint. Our belief is that better business leads to a better planet. Who wouldn't want to make things that have less impact on our society? It's a podcast for people who are inventors, academics, people working in the energy sector or from any different field that believe that they can do something better to make the products and services we use every day less harmful. Now, we've been running for about three years and it's been very successful with about 36,000 downloads and plenty more massive engagement. But this show now needs a sponsor. We've done it editorially for all these years, but we need your help. So we know you've got a loyal audience out there. If you'd like to get involved and sponsor the show, then email me on the email just below on your screen. And we'd like to see if you're the right fit for us and that you've got the same vision we have. Now, on to this week's episode. Now, you won't believe it, uh, particularly if you live in the UK, but apparently it's been very, very hot globally very hot. Well, let's be honest, we've been a pretty piss poor summer so far, but the world is getting warmer and where you're working, most of us, is a building. Generally, we're in either offices or factories or warehouses, which are cooled and heated automatically. Now, some places have the old fashioned way of doing it, which is you open the window, but most people have got controlled HVAC heating and ventilation systems. Now, one of the parts of net zero is trying to get the energy use of those things right down. And one of the big stumbling blocks is not so much in our country, but definitely uh, if you go onto the Europe right now, where it's kind of 35, 40 degrees, so much air conditioning going on. And people say, actually, that uses so much energy. Is there a way of cutting that down, making sure that people are working in a comfortable temperature? But by reducing that. In fact, stipulations were coming in. But a lot of people say that would make things very uncomfortable. So what's the solution? Well, a very innovative little company, uh, I'll call it little, but it might be massive, but uh, uh, it's called Symphony uh, Energy. Uh, it's based in Ireland and Tom Asco is the MD. And I think Tom, you may have cracked it. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Sumit. Um, so what is Symphony Energy? Tell us about it. First of all, so it's, it's an energy efficiency company and it's sort of grown out of a consultancy practice, which the consultancy practice uh, was trying to bridge the gap between, you know, let's say a good concept design, you know, you know, energy efficient in theory and then match that with the actual delivered energy efficiency. And in our industry, that's known as the performance gap. And it's uh, it's significant. It's, it's sort of r rampant. Um, um, practically every building surf suffers from it where you, you think you're going to get a lot more energy performance based on design yeah. and really you don't. So we started off the journey trying to bridge the consultancy know-how with the technology to deliver the actual energy performance. And from our consultancy firm, we've set up a second firm called Symphony Energy, um, and that was in 2011. So for the past, you know, what, 13 years, we've been in an R&D mode Um you know, trying to really deliver this aspiration. And we've done it one project at a time. We're building our technology, our know-how, testing, trialing, but all, always in a live environment. It had to work from day one. Um, and we got strong results really right back as far as 2014. And we've built on that. But really in the last in the last five years, we've stepped up the technology to really develop in-house technology and one particular process we've patented and it's a real game changer for achieving the ultimate Paris approved 2050 energy efficiency targets and it really plays into what you're just talking about there in terms of you know how do we get our cooling load under control where yeah. we're comfortable but it's affordable and, we, and certainly that patented process will help a lot on that our other two technologies, uh, we've dubbed them, uh, the first one is performance algorithms. It's really about taking your existing HVAC infrastructure and basically forensically examining it, whereby we identify what we call the environmental signature of a building. A building, it's like its demand you know, in terms of heat and cooling ventilation 
yeah, is is changing every moment of every day in every part of your building, and it has a, it has a signature. So we try to identify that and to identify its pattern, and then we look to to find a matching plant output uh, signature, and then we look to put them together and automate them. And so we call that our performance algorithms. We're we're, we're really struggling for a term, but that's basically <laughs> what we so far. Let me stop you because I it, it sounds good, and we're going to explore it, but you're going to make mm. it simple for a brain like mine. So let's start at the beginning. So most people have heard of HVAC and you're in an office, you've got air conditioning units, but often like the building we're in, in the summer now, we turn it on as an AC system to cool us down. In the winter, it's the same thing as a heating. Now, if I'm right, I think the building sector is about a third of global energy emissions. Uh, and people always talk about heating decarbonisation, never really talks about cooling decarbonisation. So... Before we explain what you're doing, um, what is the challenge regarding cooling? Because as I said, you know, my wife's family are from Italy and there it's been ridiculous. 44, 45 degrees in the south the last month. And we have a colleague here who's Greek and it's been even worse there. So people are whacking up the AC. My family comes from India where everyone's running ACs in buildings. So the the global picture, we probably put our own spin on it. We always think about here, how do we decarbonize heat to keep us warm? But how big is the issue of cooling around the world? It's massive. <clears throat> um, and the, the, the challenge with, with cooling is that as you tackle the heat, you actually make the cooling challenge more challenging because your, your, in, your buildings are better insulated and retain a lot of yes. So yeah. that can actually work against you. In terms of the global stats, yeah, billions account for 40% of total global emissions and 27% is just the operation of buildings. And half of that is HVAC. So wow. yeah, HVAC is a huge, huge part. Now, typically what we do when we have, we have three technologies, when we put them all together, we typically reduce the energy consumption in a building by 60 to 80%. Like, and that's typical. That's not the exception. That's the norm. In terms of cooling, uh, mm. well, the patented piece is really about capturing the cooling before it gets really hot outside. So just before we get yeah. into that, explain to the listeners and viewers how normal buildings are cooled. How, what's the normal old process been running for about 100 years and, on, on, on air conditioning? So most buildings, uh, most medium to large buildings, certainly, and even some smaller buildings too, traditionally and to this day, uh, they have got, let's say the space that you're in now probably has a fan coil system. So you've got a box in your ceiling that's got yep. a heating coil and a cooling coil with heating pipes into it and cooling pipes out of it. And when you want heating, the cooling, uh, when you want heating, the heating valve opens and that's heating to the coil and the air passes through that coil and heats you up. And likewise for cooling, for, uh, with the cooling coil. Those cooling and heating coils go back to chillers for, for, for the cooling and either boilers or heat pumps for the heating. Right. Um, so that's what you normally have. But just think outside of the first, initially think outside of peak summertime. Think of, you know, if you're in the UK um, for most of the year, it's not summertime. It's miserable. It is miserable, yeah. <laughs> but you're still... I you're, think the only place that's likely more miserable than us is yeah. where you are. Yeah, well, exactly. So, but nevertheless, in your building, you're going to have meetings on and in meeting rooms. And Correct. People, hot and you have to have your cooler yeah, on yeah. as well as your heater so our process essentially piggybacks the hvac infrastructure where you got pumps and fans that have to operate anyway and where you're supplying air into a building and it's cold outside you have to heat that air up before you bring it in you can't send that sense. cold yeah. air into somebody even if they're no. looking for cooling you need to warm it up a, a bit so normally in that your heating coil comes on in your air supply in your main air supply and then your cooling coil is closed because you don't want to cool the air coming into your building um, and instead you have your chiller dealing with your your overheating room and your boiler dealing with your underheated space so what we've recognized is that okay you're not in peak summer therefore what whereas your your cooling system is designed for peak summer so it's got capacity and you know the, the chill water temperatures are you know need to be fairly low to deal with your peak demand but you're not in that condition. So we can let the chill water temperature rise and become more tepid and still be able to satisfy the cooling load. So what we do is we recognize that the cooling coil is off in the air handler because it should right. be you know, in normal conditions. But with this tepid rather than very cold chill water, we can actually open that up and make it convert it into a chiller, essentially, whereby the outside air comes through the coil, meets this tepid water, that type of water then heats the air coming into the building so the heating coil can back off on the air handling unit, but uh -huh. then it also cools the cooling water 
and the cooling water then goes back to the meeting room where it's needed and cools the meeting room and gathers that waste heat and that cycle just continues such that the net effect is that your chiller and its primary plant is entirely off where it was in you know it was on pre previously and your boiler has has been able to back off because it has a lower heating load in the air handler so the fans and pumps that make that work already have to be in operation you need to have fans putting air into your building you need to have water circulation for your heating and cooling yeah. so the net input the net input energy is zero but the benefit is 100% free cooling 100% free heating and certainly here on the on the buildings we we here in, here in Dublin so far, they're using this process for 80% of the year, which means that for 80% of the year, the entire cooling system, you know, the primary cooling system is shut down and the benefit, beneficial heat is deducted from the heating or gas, whatever input into the building. It's a phenomenal shift in energy performance. And that is the difference. And that's what's bridging between really good design or, or, or less than good design even, and meeting the ultimate Paris Proof 2050 efficiency targets. Let's put some figures on it. So let, let's, so we can paint a picture. My building, it's, I don't know, November, right? The outside air temperature is say 12 degrees or 11 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. What would normally happen is that's too cold and I want my office at around about 18 to 20, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the air would come in, uh, wouldn't touch it. We'd basically turn on the heat and heat that air up. Correct? Nor normally, yeah. yeah. So what's your system do with that air temperature that's at kind of 11, 12 degrees to get my room at 18 degrees by using less energy? So the tepid chill water is, is, is the, the cooling coil is opened up, letting this 15, 16, even 17 degree water into it. Right. That, that's, that's met with the 12 degree air. Okay. And 12 degree air then becomes... 15 or 16 degrees centigrade. Ah. And now your heater only needs to heat it from 15, 16 to 18, not from 12. rather than from 11. Yeah. Yeah. And because that, that that heat transfer has taken place, your 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 15 degree water now is 13, your 14 degrees. And that's good enough. And that goes back to your meeting room and uh, it, it goes into the fan coil, the box in your ceiling. The cooling coil opens up, sends this tepid water in and uh, the, the air in the room passes through this 13, 14 degree air, uh, water and gets cooled and gives you enough cooling in your in your building. So and you can have one, one room that needs heat mm -hmm. that's taking less energy because mm -hmm. you've, you've just used the air and warmed it up naturally from the heat transfer. And you've yeah. got another room that needs cooling that needs less energy because mm -hmm. you haven't turned on the cooling thing. Is that yes. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. And because even if any room needs cooling and, it, you know, you're not going to need as much cooling outside of summer as you will throughout the year. But of course. the problem is, is that somewhere needs cooling all the time. So your big, big, heavy, you know, mega chill water plant has to operate to deal with wherever it is needed. But we're saying, no, we can shut you down. And you can go to sleep until summer comes. And that's a massive, massive saving in energy. Is this designed to work basically um, in the more temperate parts of the world? So, for example, could it work in the Middle East? Could it work uh, in parts of Africa? Was it really for stuff in the kind of, you know, Europe and where we, where we are now? Yeah, the metrics that we've looked at, it works, ideally works somewhere um, 30 degrees north or south of the equator. So that would capture the USA, really all of the USA, but my, the lower parts would have fewer periods in the yeah. year you know, compared to the higher parts. Um, we'll cover um, uh, Europe, most of Europe or all of Europe. Yeah. We'll cover Russia, China, Australia, Argentina, Chile, South Korea, South Africa, you know, the, all, all those places, the major industrial developed parts of the world, it, it, it works in it. In terms of the energy efficiency, um, I know you said you've installed this in a couple of places. Can you, ex you don't have to name who they are, but can you give an example of what the, the, the change is, how much mm. they've saved in terms yeah. of either carbon or money? Uh, yeah, and I'll give you a perspective. So um, one of our clients, um, one of our clients has a portfolio of billings and they heard about Symphony and they're keen to really test us. So they essentially took their best building. They took a building that, 
Um, it was a renovated building, which is actually good news as well, because a lot of retained carbon. A new, a new one or an old one? No, it was a 1970s building. It was renovated okay. in 2016, so the structure is still the same. It even right. looks the same from the outside. But they would have upgraded the fabric and, and, and so on. Um, so it was brought to a lead, what's called lead platinum status in 2017. So that placed it in roughly the top 5% of performing buildings. Um, and it's basically. an office or it's a factory? What is it? It's an office. In fact, okay. yeah, so it's... it's um. It's it's owned by Hibernia, which is owned in turn owned by Brookfield, and Brookfield are a massive property empire. And it's home to Twitter or X's European headquarter. So, ah, right. yeah. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Got to keep them cool with uh, Elon yeah. breathing down their neck. That's yeah, it. that's it. So so essentially, we were starting with a building that's in the top five percent performer. So it really looked like really you know what could we do? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, we deployed our three technologies. Um we'd only we only recently got a patent on the heat recycling process, which I described to you there a moment ago. Deployed all three and we ended up reducing the HVAC uh electricity by 75% and the HVAC gas by 76%. And essentially we brought that energy use intensity of that building from 121 down to 44 that places it places it between the par the interim paris proof 2030 target and the ultimate paris proof 2050 target however all the client now needs to do is just swap the gas boilers for a heat pump and it will undercut it will smash through the paris proof 2050 target which is a first and an unheard of um uh, achievement in the sector those figures are stunning Mm. But you started off with a building uh, playing devil advocate that was already very efficient. Mm -hmm. What yeah. if you're stuck with a building that's frankly a piece of crap that's been left since the 50s or 60s, which are plenty. We had one before, mm. not insulated, aluminium windows, crappy radiators or electric. It, 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 I'm not trying to knock it. I'm trying to just see how you think this could work across the board, because that's the big challenge for whether it's heating or cooling decarbonisation is the variety of different fabrics our buildings are in whether they're offices or factories or whatever are so varied aren't they yeah no well we can apply our technology on, on on any building of any age as long as there's something to apply it to if you have a 1950s building and and you don't, you don't really have the services to to improve then so be it we've done a building in the uk uh, for a large chip manufacturer um computer chip manufacturer and it was a 1980s building and we reduced the what was it, the gas was reduced by 70 uh 75 percent and the electricity wow. HVAC electricity was reduced by 85 percent so now th that's even after reducing that amount of energy then it still would be consuming more energy of than course really. of course yeah so uh, the good news is but that you've got to start somewhere you've got to start somewhere when you yeah. when you those, I, mean, I would say that building now in the uk is performing better than most 10 year old buildings you know so and it's um, 40 years old yeah it is yeah and, and and a building like that really like it gets to a point where like your own home whatever you know it's time to change the windows and, and just life cycle renewal yes. there's more maintenance cost but i would say buildings under 30 years of age we can probably get them to or close to the ultimate paris proof 2050 target without a big spend so like we sometimes we recommend you know you should have you know an improvement here or there not a change an improvement and whereas, whereas we're sort of you know our, our our pricing point for this full change is about six to eight uh, pounds or euro per square foot um savills uh, in may of this year said that to bring to bring the dublin building office stock up to um standard it needed 90 to 300 euro per square foot wow. so if you apply to 90 to 300 square foot you will get let's say a b or a rated building but uh, research has shown that the actual performance of A, B, C, D, E and F, G buildings, uh, the mean average uh, performance is about the same. So you spend all this money and you don't hit your target. If you spend six to eight euro per square foot on a relatively, say, relatively new building, let's say under 10 years of age, you're probably going to hit the Paris Pooh 20, 20, 50 target. Um, and uh, uh, and if, if it needs a little bit of help, I'd say no more than 30 euro per square foot. In terms of translating that into money, uh, say in the Dublin office market, six to eight euro per square foot is about six to eight weeks of rent. Gotcha. 30, right. 30 euro per square foot is about 30 weeks. And that would be one for, let's say, a building that's 30 years old. Yeah. Um, I, I like all of this. I just want to get the thing that people will be going, they'll be screaming at home and listening or whatever in the office going, is this a retrofit job? How much am I going to have to cough up? But you've told me 
you don't have to if you came here to my building you don't have to well, my landlord would be very happy about this you don't have to take out any of these units you don't have to stick a bit of machinery in it you don't have to have an engineer you just reprogram the thing that's controlling the building is that right, right? correct for the three technology we have three technologies the one that you're referring to that, that i described correct nothing physical change at all just programming and that can be programmed by the incumbent maintenance contractor, or we can put in a a, a digital control device with the algorithm uh, algorithms on it and connect it into your building management system, either or. Um, but you you technically do not need any physical change in your building. Our other two technologies, the first one, which is the performance algorithms. Again, we don't need any physical change, but we might recommend some improvements. Let's say if a, a fan doesn't have variable speed control on it, we'd say, well, why don't, don't you put a variable speed control around it? Then we can actually ramp its output. Understood. <laughs> you know, so, and then the third technology, which I haven't mentioned yet, is um, is a piece of electronics hardware we had to develop ourselves because the market wasn't recognizing the need for it. So it's quite a big uh, venture for us. So we, our electronics team designed a, what's called a multi-sensor controller. It's, you know, there are a lot of devices in the market that measure all your indoor air quality methods. Yeah, yeah. Great, fine. With, if, that, if that's all we needed, we would have just gone to the market and bought those devices to get what we wanted to do. But all they do is diagnose your indoor air quality problem. They don't fix it. We needed something that would automatically diagnose and fix. We needed a measurement and control in the one device. Hence, we had to go and produce it ourselves. So it took us five years. We have it. We call it Symphony Well Tech as in wellness technology. And so, for example, you know, in your building now, people are... Are not evenly spaced around the building. You know, no, cluster, correct. Yeah, yeah. there are clusters here and clusters there, but your air has been commissioned to deliver what's called design quantities of fresh air to all parts of the building at all times, so that people can move around and always have fresh air. Right. However, you really only need the air to follow the people. So, <laughs> we this device will do that in conjunction with. Um, an actuator that goes on a commissioned damper that's already there in your building. So you just have a small um, actuator that sits onto this damper, works with our device. Um, it's a small piece of wire between the two of them. And we get this sort of perfect, sort of precise demand control ventilation where the air follows the people. So yeah, there's a bit of a bit of retrofit on that, but we're talking about tiny, tiny, tiny stuff. Can't believe you're an engineer, mate. Uh, well, <laughs> where are you going with that? <laughs> <laughs> I really like it. I think it's a very clever thing because I'm all for things that don't cost people money because that's going to be such a barrier. I don't care what people say. A lot of people, at the end of the day, it is down to the money. And if you can say that actually for quite a little cost and no disturbance, because who wants in our office a bunch of workmen coming in and stripping that machine out and pulling it out? We don't want that. No. I think it's very clever. Um, where are you going to go with this? What are you trying to do with it? OK, so um, we've only been able to bring this to a broader public attention in the last 18 months because of the patent process and also developing right. the third technology. Um, we've also had clients that we would have loved to have told the world about because everybody knows who they are. <laughs> but they said don't say and if, anything. Yeah, and if, <laughs> if other clients had heard that we've got X as or whatever, you know, you know, we could you know get out there and say it. But um, uh, it's been hard. Uh, that's been difficult. So we've now just brought our technology to 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 competitions and right. we want the so so the Irish government here runs a, a a sustainability competition and one of its categories I'd say perhaps the most coveted category is design uh, digital uh, sustainability via digital technology so the 2023 awards were in November last and we won that well done. Uh, Thank you. Um, and hot on the heels of that, we won the KPMG and Irish Independent Awards for uh, tech technology innovation. Um, and then this year, we won a the government has an energy show, and we won best energy services provider in it. But probably the, our 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 biggest prize so far has been um, month we won the Urban Land Institute, ULI, uh, Ireland, and UK 
Pop Tech Innovation Challenge 2024, which means, yes, that's an Ireland and UK win. And it means we now represent both countries going into the European finals later this, this year. Sounds like Eurovision. I like it, mate. It is, yeah. There's going to be, you know, <laughs> the four chairs and whatever. And, and of course, now you've been on the Net Hero podcast. What more do you want, Tom? Well, I'm, we're sorted now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Tom, I think what yeah. you're doing is very good. Check out Symphony. Thank you very much for joining me on the podcast today. Best of okay, luck with it. You. Thank you. Tell me what you think, audience. What do you think about this challenge? I think it's the biggest thing we've got to do is do our HVAC and get it right. Check out what Symphony's doing. I think it's very clever. If you've got a story, because uh, Tom didn't mention, but he's got a colleague who badgered me on LinkedIn to get this on, and it was very clever. So well done to him. Get in touch. Uh, you can do that either via social media or by emailing nethero at futurenetzero.com. I'll catch you soon. You've just heard the Net Hero podcast from futurenetzero.com. Join us as we help you find ways to cut your carbon footprint as we head towards net zero. Subscribe and follow us on social media. futurenetzero.com. Better business, better planet. <laughs>